This con this conference will now be recorded. Hi there, everyone. Today I'm going to talk at you about beneficial arthropods. What are arthropods? Why are they beneficial? Why should you be deeply in love with them? All right, so if you want to get a hold of me, if you have any questions or comments, if you have rude comments, don't bother. But if you have great comments or um, let's see, helpful comments, those are certainly welcome. You can reach me at Better Nature Solutions, so that's betternature.solutions, and you will find my, you can either directly contact me through that messaging, but you'll also find my Gmail account there as well. So let me get this into a slideshow format and we will get going. We're doing multiple things right now, so long as battery lasts. All right, this is a bit of a lengthy, but that's because bugs are amazing. All right, so insects are not bugs and they're not bad, which sadly, many people freak out, are terrified of, find them distasteful, disgusting, etc. But without insects and arthropods, our world would be a very um, homogeneous, monotonous place. It would not be nearly as magical. So what are these things? Well, over here we have some amazing drawings by this guy Ernst Haeckel, scientist and clearly an artist as well. If you haven't heard of him, I definitely recommend check him out. Google some of his images. He's got everything from like starfish to trees to, as you can see here, arachnids. Um, Arthropods include these arachnids, things called insects, things called myriapods, and what we also call crustaceans, some of which we eat, like crabs and lobster, or at least some of us eat. Insects, as you probably remember from high school, have three body segments and three pairs of legs, or six legs total. Now, what you might not remember is that they go through very different life stages, meaning or they can go through very different life stages. Going from a caterpillar to a butterfly, that's a wild change, right? Caterpillar basically like dissolves itself, goes, makes its own little blender, and then comes out a butterfly. That's wild. And then beetles, they start out as grubs. So if you've ever been digging in the garden or um, someone you know has been digging in the garden, there's that white or cream colored thing with a little head on the end that's black or uh, maybe a yellowish gold. Uh, that's a grub. It's got lots of little legs, and that will turn into something like a um, staghorn beetle or a lady beetle, that kind of thing. So, really different looking life stages. Arachnids have two body segments usually, so one and two. This is a whip scorpion. I was lucky enough to see one of these. The size of my hand, they're, they're harmless. They don't look harmless, right? They look like an alien. Um, but I got to see one when I was in Costa Rica. I was on the wall of the bunk, a little cabin we were in, very cool. Um, but two body segments, one, two. And then we've got four pairs of legs, eight legs. And these are like chelicera or the little um, mouth parts. And molting is how they grow. So you've got a little teeny tiny version of this thing or a little teeny tiny version of a crab. And the reason you get soft shell crabs, if any of you have been uh, fortunate enough to be able to eat those, uh, they are soft shelled because as they are molting out of a smaller size, this is their exoskeleton. They wear their skeleton on the outside of their body. As they molt out of this exoskeleton, they're in a very soft stage before the new skeleton that is underneath or exoskeleton that's underneath hardens. So this is true of tarantulas. They have to be very careful where they're hanging out when they're going through that hardening stage. So they look very similar as they molt into larger versions of themselves. Myriapods are things like your centipedes and your millipedes. And oddly enough, your wood lice and the pill bugs, these are crustaceans, sometimes called isopods. It's so tons of diversity in the arthropod kingdom. 
So we have this cyanide producing millipede, which in the um, eastern part of the US will have uh, a yellow or pink markings that are telling the birds, hey, don't eat me because I got cyanide. So if you pick one of these up and shake it in your hand, it smells like almonds because that almond smell is the smell of cyanide. Pretty cool. And of course they won't bite. So I recommend picking it up, shaking them. Don't do it too much. You know, it's got to be stressful for them. They're emitting that uh, cyanide warning signal. So that's a stress signal. Uh, these insects play a major role in reducing and controlling the population of both plants that we might consider pests. So sometimes plants can be pests, as well as plant pests. And like this guy here, they're decomposers. So this guy's critical in decomposing the dead leaf litter or other dead organisms, breaking it down into smaller parts so that smaller organisms can break it down to even smaller parts so that eventually it's broken down so small that you've got organic matter in your soils, which is critically important for healthy soils and healthy microbes in those soils, which without, uh, we would not have plants. All right, so plants need microbes just like we do, and they have our own microbiome, and that microbiome is fed, um, or the that food becomes available as things like this decompose it. And then you have these beautiful, like blue needle waves of wasps or hornets. Um, this is a wasp, uh, and um, they are hunters of. You'll see a picture soon. These guys hunt spiders. And they can also be pollinators. So not only they're pollinating plants, but they're also, if you're freaked out about spiders, will sometimes get rid of, you know, brown recluses and things like that, or tarantulas. Um, then we have fireflies, which believe it or not, in their juvenile stage, look a lot like lady beetles and are super cool and helpful. And then we have things like this paper wasp and braconid wasps will lay their eggs. These guys are pollinators. And these guys will lay their eggs on a caterpillar like this tobacco or tomato hornworm. And then when these larvae hatch, they will devour this thing. And thus you don't have to pick them off your tomato plants, etc. All right, so the life cycle of firefly, these guys are carnivorous. They have carnivorous larvae. When they're adults, they probably don't even have a mouth part. They're just flying around and lighten up in order to mate. But in all the stages before, from larvae and pupa, they are carnivorous and they eat a lot. And um, so the pupa and larva are soil dwellers in and just above the soil, okay? And they will spit digestive enzymes onto the snails and worms that they're attacking. And then those digestive enzymes make sort of a external shake and then they slurp up that shake. Mm. And then we have assassin bugs. These are really interesting. So in their early instar or young stages, they're gonna look different than when they're mature. So this is growing some wings, it's very young. And so when those wings are mature, it will cover the entire back part of the body or the abdomen. These are ambush predators. They'll typically just hang out and wait for another insect to come along and then they'll ambush it, catch it. They're generalists, so that means they'll eat anything, including beneficial lady beetles, but they'll also eat caterpillars, aphids, um, cockroaches. That's really nice. I like that. And then there's a certain group of them that are actually specialized to milkweed. Why would they be specialized just to milkweed? And when I say milkweed, I'm talking about the Asclepias or the butterfly weed that produces a latex. And the monarch, if you remember, the monarch caterpillar feeds on that weed because it is able to neutralize that latex instead of being poisoned by it and actually sequester it in this body. And after it goes through its blender experience in the um, um, caterpillar cocoon and becomes a monarch butterfly, it still has that latex in it to help um, keep it from getting eaten by birds. So maybe these guys are doing something similar, huh? Not gonna tell you. All right, lace wings. These guys are amazing, amazing. All right, they eat a lot of um, different types of insects as well because they're generalists. So they'll 
go after white flies, mites, psyllids, thrips. These are things that will often mess up your flowers. I have white flies twice, that's too bad. They will also go after um, some of the caterpillars that are notorious for getting into clothing. Uh, they have a very simple life cycle, like the lady beetle. So basically they have that larval stage that is the most voracious, um, doing the most help for you. That will cocoon. And then emerging will be this beautiful lacewing green bug. These are the eggs. Uh, you might have seen these as a kid or your kids might find them. They take a pretty good eye. You're going to find them on the undersurface of a leaf or a stem and they're just dangling on that beautiful thin little silk wire or silk strand and a female can lay up to 200 eggs in a season. They use venom to kill uh, their insect uh, foods and they will cannibalize each other. So these are great. You can buy these at Arbico and other places. I have a link. I should have a link on my website to Arbico. Uh, that's a great place to get your beneficial insects. These lace wings are not expensive. I've put out a couple of generations the last two spring and summer. So I put out one last spring and summer and then another group this spring and summer. And I should have enough provided my neighbors don't use a lot of pesticides since I don't use a pesticides or I use them sparingly. I should have these just coming back year after year after year doing the work for me so I don't have to. All right, parasitic wasps. So these are personally one of my favorites. Wasps get a bad rap but they are incredibly important and there's over 600,000 species, known species of wasps. They predate bees so but they emerge from the same lineage. So they are evolutionarily very closely related. And it looks like bees arose from wasps. Now, most wasps, just like most bees, are solitary. They're not like the paper wasps that congregate in groups. And most of them actually are so tiny, um, less than an eighth of an inch, that they would not be able to puncture the skin of a human. Okay, so they can't actually sting you. They will lay their eggs in or on insect bodies. If they paralyze or not, um, if they're endoparasitic, then they're gonna cause paralysis. So they're laying eggs inside the body of the insect, paralyzing it. That insect, so that's what's happening here. That caterpillar will just stop moving and the eggs will be laid inside here. It's paralyzed. So if you see a caterpillar stuck to a leaf, it may be that there's a bunch of little baby wasps developing and then they will eat their way out of this neurally dead caterpillar. So presumably it doesn't know what the heck's going on. Others, uh, that's the same here for the, um, these needle hoisted wasps or the, uh, that will go after things like uh, brown recluses and tarantulas. What we saw in the previous picture with that, uh, all those eggs on the outside of the hornworm, that's an ectoparasite. There's no paralysis involved. And those eggs are just attached to the body of the caterpillar. And then when they hatch, they will consume that caterpillar. Probably a little bit more horrific death. All right, crab jumping and wolf spiders. Also all very useful. Spiders get a bad rap, but they're so amazing. If you can just get a little handbook on all the different shapes and sizes and colors that these arachnids come in, I think that you're, if you have a, an opposition to them, it might change, which is one reason why I have shown here the crab spider. So this spider does not build a web, which we often think of. Many spiders are actually also ambush predators, so they lay in wait for their insect prey, and like this one is done with a, a robber fly. Is this a robber fly or a bee fly? I don't know. Anyway, so this guy, cool, right? Yellowish and white. And so from another insect's perspective, it does not exist. They're also generalists, so they're gonna eat things that are beneficial like this pollinator, as well as things that we don't want around, our um, gardens and flowers. Now this guy, let's say, it hops on over to pink flower. It's not doing very good here. So it's white, yellowish right now, and hops on over to pink flower. 
Within a couple of hours, it will have changed its color to pink to blend in with that flower's petals. How cool is that? I so want to be able to change my color to blend in, or maybe just because I want to be green one day and another day I feel like being blue. That would be amazing. But they can do it and we can't. Uh, females will carry the egg sac. So a lot of times if you look in the ground, a lot of ground spiders will actually have this like big round ball in front of them. And that's because they're carrying their egg sac around with them. Like they're not leaving that someplace where something else could attack it. They're gonna carry those babies with them. And then the babies, when they hatch, they will hang out on the parent's back for quite some time until they're mature enough to have a better survival rate on their own. So there's some real parenting that's going on with these spiders. Think about that. Parent spiders, so invested in their kid, they're carrying that egg around and then carrying those babies on their back. All right, so some specialist predators include some of these beetles. They're really cool um, that we see right here. And so these guys will uh, devour things like slugs. So if you've got slugs that are torturing your hostas or other plants and you see some of these black beetles around, a lot of times people think they're stink bugs. Um, they will sometimes emit a slightly acidic, not enough to cause any harm to you, but enough to cause harm to something that might want to eat it. Um, or sometimes it's just a spray to scare the um, predator like a bird away. But if you do see these guys around, I recommend keeping them. Don't spray them. You want to spray inside your house, okay, but if you're going to spray outside your house, you're going to lose some of these guys that will take care of these slugs and other things for you. There's also predatory mites. There are predatory mites that live in the soil and predatory mites that you can buy from Arbico and other places and release. I've had some great success leading um, from releasing these predatory mites. And there's a ton of species and they are significantly impacted by pesticides. So we use a lot of pesticides to hit things like mites and mealybugs and scale. Um, oftentimes it can be misapplied. Uh, and um, I'll show you that a lot of times what we're using can also lead to outbreaks of other insects we don't want around. So yeah, if you want to treat mites and thrips, I recommend buying some of the predatory mites. Be really fun if you have kids or if your neighbor has kids and you want to show them what this is like. They're not that expensive. And again, you release them a couple of years or a few years. And as long as you've got mites and thrips coming into your yard, these guys are just going to be around year after year after year to do the work for you. So you'll save money on spraying with insecticides and also expose you, your family, your pets to less insecticides, which is always a good thing. Um, six spotted thrip. You can buy these and they eat mites. There's a thing called a mealybug destroyer that eats mealybugs. It's a beetle, really cool looking beetle. This guy is pretty expensive. So I would say if you have like constant year after year issue with mealybugs, um, then I would definitely get it. I think it's really a great solution for greenhouse growers, um, especially greenhouse growers who want to sell plants that are not insecticide. Uh, that don't have a lot of insecticides in them. All right, other generalists include robber flies. So these will eat other insects. There's a thing called long-legged flies. Who knew? Flies, many flies are actually useful from our human perspective in that they will consume insects we don't want around. All right, some of this fantastical diversity that we see also leads to amazing diversity in plants. So we find that plants will create homes or domiciles for things like predatory thrips and predatory mites or tiny, tiny beetles by creating these little tufts or little like um, almost like a pocket. You'll find these on the undersurface of a leaf. Uh, I recommend turn over a pin oak leaf or a, a red oak, one of the red oaks, and you're likely to find these fuzzy tufts. And these are houses for insects that will eat other insects or often the case will eat fungi. So fungi that would land on this leaf and start to cause an infection, those insects are gonna 
smell that fungus, go for it, and keep that leaf clean. So this is called a mutualism. It's where both organisms, the plant and the insect, mutually benefit by investing in each other. That'd be cool if humans did more of that, right? All right. So Myrmecori and Eliasomes, or Eliasomes. So these are little rewards that this um, Fabaceae or pot, bean pod plant is making. So this is like a fatty protein deliciousness that will attract ants. Ants will carry it off with the seed, plant it, so they'll carry it underground, essentially planting that seed, separate this into another mass, um, and then feed themselves and their offspring with that. And the seed has gotten away from its parent plant and is nicely planted underground where it's more likely to germinate. So that's clever. Pollination is another example of mutualism. Um, and I just want you to think a little bit about what all of this diversity in nature, the diversity of insects, the diversity of types of relationships between plants and insects, what that can offer us from a health perspective, from a, a human perspective, from an intellectual perspective, a creative perspective, and even an emotional perspective. Now, not to forget, the soils are this amazing ocean of diversity under our feet with billions of organisms in a handful of soil. Billions in a handful of soil. So some of the soil beneficials are going to be macroscopic, meaning big. We can see them without a scope. And others will be microscopic. Right, so we've got our decomposers here, right, myriapods, and then we've got our little mite crustaceans. So this is a root feeding mite, and this is a mite that eats the root feeding mite, right? So when we do pour insecticides onto the ground willy nilly, <clears throat> we are getting rid of some of the beneficials, including those that will actually help create healthier soils by forming organic matter which is a specialized layer of soil that has introduces a lot more nutrients in the soil and thus saves us money on fertilization. But also we are killing potentially um, the fungal and bacterial communities that plants cannot live without. So most bacteria and fungi in the soil, at least most fungi, I'm not sure about bacteria, honestly, but at least most of the fungi in the soil appear to be mutualistic. So they are either not doing harm or they're actually benefiting the plant and they're benefiting each other, which is why it's mutualism. <clears throat> so how do you increase beneficials? Well, one way obviously is that you can start buying them and just introducing them into your yard. But if you're gonna do that, you wanna stop topical bark sprays in around September or October, okay? So if you're using topical bark sprays, um, to treat your trees or your shrubs, you wanna stop that September, October. You're not gonna use them in the winter anyway, because that's where some of your beneficials are gonna overwinter. Not only that, but your nuthatch bird species and other birds will also hide their insect. Um, so if they collect a lot of insects in a day, they'll put them in those little bark crevices. And if they stay in your place throughout the winter, you're actually spraying their food with insecticide and that's part of the reason there are several reasons but that's part of the reason that we're losing birds in the hundreds of billions so you can also provide a lot of nectar and pollen rewards and a diversity of types of pollen and nectar throughout the growing season so some plants some cultivated plants will not provide a lot of nectar um, or they'll provide a nectar that's actually not very rich in resources. So butterfly bush, people love butterfly bush. It brings a lot of insects, but its nectar reward is actually not that great. Um, it doesn't compare to most of the nectar rewards that you're gonna get from your native flora. And that's because native plants or plants that are indigenous to the area that you live in, they've been evolving for hundreds of thousands of years with their pollinating insects. And so they've been fine tuning their relationship for hundreds of thousands of years. And that's why you're gonna get a better nectar pollen pollination relationship. But 
when you've got those high diversity um, indigenous plants in your yard. The diversity is important because that means you're going to have more types of bees and other pollinating insects and that's going to attract other insects, a greater diversity of insects, some of which will be beneficial, some of which won't. Either way, you're going to attract more birds because the majority of birds are insect eaters. Now, I have pictured a orb weaver here, which I think is beautiful. Well, you know, that's some lovely coloration. It's like a stained glass window. So you'll see these guys, they make those crazy looking webs in your shrubbery, and then they will create these egg sacs that are on this incredibly strong line. And this will often be found in your shrubs or your Japanese maples. You want to protect those guys because they do a lot of work with this um, beautiful webbing in the spring and summer, picking up thrips and other mites and insects that are going to cause problems. So uh, sometimes when I'm pruning, I'll find one of these and I'll just gently move it to another twig or branch over here so that I'm not destroying it. And you want to consider changing your lawn to a native meadow or a combination native meadow lawn or you could put in a hedgerow, or you could put in, reduce your lawn size by creating a big um, native flora, native plant, you know, annual perennial garden. Um, and the reason you wanna do that is twofold, well, maybe multiple, but two major components are, um, lawns are called in the horticultural industry and e ecological industry or ecological sciences, are called green deserts. They're green deserts because you usually have, you know, one to half a dozen different types of grass. They usually require a lot of input if you want that grass to look uniform and green. Those inputs include fertilizers and pesticides. Weed and feeds are one of the worst things you can do for soil fauna, biodiversity, those microbes I talked about. And so essentially, lawns and the care of lawns lead to sterilization of soil. <clears throat> as well as not providing any habitat or food resources for your pollinators or your birds. Um, we keep that grass low. Now having native grasses, some tall native grasses in your yard are excellent for providing overwintering shelter um, and also they can attract bird species. We'll love some of those seeds. So you can increase soil health by increasing the porosity of soil the microbial community diversity. Um, you can even change the pH and definitely increase the organic matter accumulation by changing at least a portion of your lawn to you know, annuals or ephemerals or native meadow habitat or this hedgerow phenomena, which is really getting big in um, parts of the US and the UK. And hopefully we used to have hedgerows as a common phenomena in agriculture and with big ag the equipment got bigger and the hedgerows disappeared so the hunting around those agricultural farms also disappeared we lost a lot of turkeys and other animals that um, people my age in their 20s would go out and hunt so those are being reintroduced I just want to show you here um, that uh, if we look at glyphosate rate per crop per year, so this is herbicide glyphosate, use on corn, cotton, and soybean since the end introduction of Roundup tolerant GM crops. So the GM crop that's been made Roundup tolerant is cotton, blue, soybean in green, and corn in yellow. What that means is that a farmer could go out and spray that field with glyphosate and because these guys are tolerant, it, they're just going to sequester that glyphosate into specialized cells and keep growing, while all the weedy stuff around them would die. But because of this thing called evolution and natural selection, that can only work for a limited amount of time. So what you find here is that the rate of spraying has to increase instead of decrease year after year. It should have to decrease, right? Because if you keep killing off those weeds and they can't make more babies, right? 
they should decline over time. Even with birds bringing them some seeds in and wind, uh, wind bringing some seeds in. But because these start to lose, um, sorry, these weeds in between the cotton, soybean, and corn start to lose, um, the, the glyphosate loses efficacy. They become resistant as well. And I'm gonna explain how that resistance happens, but you can think about it in terms of antibiotics. So there's a lot of staphylococcus in um, hospitals now or staph infections, and that's because we've used so many antibiotics and we have so many antibacterial soaps and scrubs and everything is antibacterial that now we have staph staphy bacteria that are resistant to the majority of antibiotics so we have to make more antibiotics and then you know we make another bacteria or another several bacteria resistant and you end up with these massive infections it's the same kind of thing same phenomenon all right, as you can see, the global pesticide sales by region has in, started to increase um, since 2008, right? So it was flat, a little bit flat in North America. It's been increasing steadily in Latin America, Asia, and Europe. And Europe even is more typically more stringent about the use of pesticides, and yet those pesticides continue to increase. And part of the reason for that is because of increased resistance to the pesticides. I'm not gonna bother explaining this one because I feel like I've spent a lot of time on um, uh, graphs. All right, so evolution and ecology matter. Here's how it happens. It's called an evolutionary arms race. Now, before pesticide application, you got this pesticide here, you have this huge population of beetles, all right? Let's say it's a, just an enormous population of Japanese beetle. And just out of chance, because mutations are random and most mutations are neutral in any kind of organism. Some of them are harmful, some of them are beneficial, but they're really just random. So you have this random error that happens in reading of the DNA and that leads to a mutation in terms of what protein is expressed or what enzyme expressed. It turns out that just by random chance, this guy is resistant to the pesticide. So this year it's sprayed. Um, all of these guys, almost all of them die. This guy does not die. It has babies. It gets sprayed again and its babies thrive. Most of these guys die again and you end up with a population resistant to that pesticide. So in integrated pest management, you plan your pesticide applications to avoid this kind of constant exposure to the same thing. All right. Um, it can happen here too. So uh, let's say that uh, this insect is favoring both kinds of trees, right? Both kinds of plants. But this insect favors and pref prefers the brown plant. It prefers the chocolate over the mint. This guy, I don't care, I'll eat mint, I'll eat chocolate, whatever. So these guys are going to, just by the way that they eat, they're selecting on that population of plants to say both chocolate and mint, right? Because it doesn't matter, they don't care. They're not putting pressure on a single mint or a single chocolate. Whereas these guys are going to pref preferentially eat the chocolate ones first so that if they keep eating it, you're gonna end up with a population of just mint plants. Okay, so that is also a selection pressure and it can drive extinction and it can drive the evolution of resistance to different chemistries. All right, I'm not gonna get into that genomic analysis of diversity. I'm just gonna say, there's a tremendous amount of diversity in the world, in the insect world, including this crazy cool thing that I think looks like um, a cross between a lobster. If you look at the tail, which you can't see in this picture, it looks almost like a lobster tail and a hummingbird and a moth. And it is a moth. Um, but you can see the proboscis or the mouth part is incredibly long. And that is because, as I was mentioning earlier, 
Plants and their pollinators have been co-evolving and fine-tuning their relationship for hundreds of thousands of years. And this includes things like corolla length. So some corollas are really long. You're gonna see them pollinated or things that are gonna get nectar from them are things like hummingbirds or these moths with these really long proboscis. You are not gonna see a bee pollinating this plant or going for the nectar in this plant. It's way down there. They'd have to crawl all the way down there, possibly get stuck just doesn't work. Um, so this is how coevolution happens. This guy's like, all right, these guys are excellent at pollinating. I get a lot of seeds. If I give this guy a little bit of nectar, how about I make this spur just a little bit longer and I'll only attract him. And so this is called coevolution. And extravagant traits can be the re result, like these long corollas, of coevolution. All right, we're experiencing a tremendous amount of extinction in the Anthropocene. That's the particular ge geological era that we are living through right now. And this includes arthropods, insects, and pollinators. When we think about extinction, we're also often thinking about the big sort of charismatic organisms. And as far as I'm concerned, any extinction sucks. Uh, it's natural in the world. The rate at which it's happening now not so much right that it's never been this fast in the history of things living on the earth except maybe the first bacteria and i'm not even sure about that all right so what we're seeing here is the number of arthropods all right so that's all those different types of insects and myriapods etc so the arthropods per foliage as measured in weight so their total biomass between 91 and 2007 has constantly declined, right? And this is just in the canopy. Walking sticks, looking at these really cool insects that mimic a stick and are called walking sticks. I've seen a few in my lifetime. Hopefully you have too, because that's pretty, pretty lucky. The number, this is doing a count, not a weight, has consistently declined as well um, since 1993. Now this is really disturbing. This is a bunch of um, flying insects that were captured in a forest in Germany over many years. And this forest is protected. So it's not being exposed to pesticides, um, pollution, uh, maybe some loss of habitat. Uh, but what we're seeing here as well is a decline in biomass. So that's a proxy for measuring the number of flying arthropods. And that's really all of these different species, almost all of them, so maybe this one, are declining. So it's a huge decline since 2015. Um, and then the cumulative pollinator losses just in Britain since 1850, as you can see, we start at zero. We end up with around 20. So an order of magnitude plus, losses uh, 1990 i would hate to see what it looks like now it's probably way up here all right so moving on i just want to thank you uh um by giving you some last pictures of the beautiful diversity of insects so this guy wow oh my those antenna are you serious like how fancy pants is that this is a beetle and these antenna, you can think of them as like radio antenna collecting different radio waves, but what they're doing is collecting different chemistries, different molecule sizes. And so that's how they navigate their world. Their language is chemistry. Um, that's really the language of a lot of organisms. Um, I just love this tortoiseshell beetle. Beautiful. Um, and then this one too. Wow. <laughs> that's just amazing. Um, and then this guy, jumping spiders, I think they're adorable, really cute. I know they get a bad rap. Um, this is like when you're sitting out on your porch and something suddenly jumps and it looks like a little spider, it's probably a jumping spider. They're also ambush predators. They're really great to have in the garden that devour a lot of things and they can't do you any harm. So in the future, think about how you're using your pesticides and how you're using your, your friendly little um, garden helpers out there.
when you decide how you're going to plant your yard or help plan your greenway and manage that greenway, that park, or your own yard. Again, if you have any questions, please contact me. I welcome them, and I hope this has been of interest to you and useful. Now I'm going to stop recording.